Good morning. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Jennifer Turner, and I direct the China Environment Forum here. I've been here 24 years, but the project has been around for 26 and has been digging deep for years into U.S.-China environment, energy, and climate relations. We've also kind of dived down deep into water issues, environmental justice, and plastic waste. We're actually making an educational video game on plastic, so if you're interested in that space, let me know. Um, but I have to say that even before the Belt and Road Initiative, we were here, and we were doing meetings on Chinese overseas investments. And I just realized today that my, one of my first meetings was about dam building in the Sudan. And it was a very lively meeting, I'll just tell you that much. Um, could be lively here again today, we'll see. Um, so today's meeting is, is in the spirit of looking at China's Belt and Road investments. And we know that, and I've got three panelists here who can uh, specifically explore the energy partnerships between China and the Global South with some conversation about the role of the U.S. in the space. Um, and as, you, as many of you know, China's investments in the Global South have leaned quite heavily in the energy sector on fossil fuels and critical minerals. And today in our conversations, we want to take the pulse on, you know, what's happening? Into, you know, they want to green the BRA. Is it happening? Could it happen? We will find out. We're, to kick off, um, I, want to also, I want to thank our co-sponsors of today's meetings. It's the Heinrich Bull Foundation and at the Wilson Center. A lot of my colleagues um, also co-sponsoring from the Latin America, Africa, Asia programs, as well as the Environmental Change and Security Program. Now, to kick off our conversation, we're going to have Juliana Gonzalez, who is the director of the chair on China Studies at the Latin American Faculty of Social Sciences in Argentina. That's a long title, Mammy Ma'am. Um, she's currently the assistant researcher at Argentina's National Scientific and Technical Research Council, where she focuses on China's economic and financial engagement in the global south, particularly Latin America. So today, not surprisingly, she's going to focus on Latin America, specifically Argentina, looking at China's investments and loans in renewable energy and lithium the hot topic in Washington, D.C., in case you haven't picked that up yet. All right. Second, we've got Kate Logan from the, she's an associate director of climate at the Asia Society Policy Institute, ASPE. She's also an ASPE fellow at, in, in their Center for Climate Analysis. And her fo work focuses on enhancing climate action in Asia, particularly China, where she hung her hat for a number of years. We were trying to figure out, almost 10 years ago, I met her in Beijing when she was working at the Institute for Public and Environmental Affairs with the stellar environmentalist Ma Jun, who happens to also be a global fellow. She were a Princeton and Asia person there, also at NRDC. Um, and before she went to ASPE, she worked at the Climate Works. Um, today, she's going to share some insights from ASPE's dialogues that they've been doing with the Energy Foundation in China and others in the region on how China could accelerate Southeast Asia's clean energy transition. She's got a slightly broader geographic focus, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, and the Philippines. You guys didn't go small at ASPE. Um, <laughs> and closing us out today, we have Jacqueline Musitwa, who is a senior climate finance advisor at USAID. She's an international attorney specializing in business, human rights, and sustainability. She previously had a series of leadership capacities at Rio Tinto, the Trade and Development Bank, and the World Trade Organization. Bank, sorry, not blank. Um, she's also a research associate at the China Law and Development Project at Oxford University, and in her spare time also teaches at Georgetown University. <laughs> so um, she's going to broaden out our conversation. I'm going to focus on, on what USAID is doing on climate financing and capacity building in Africa. I wanted her on the panel today because the realization, moving the global south onto a the clean energy transition path is not something one country, even China, can do alone. What is it? We were saying it takes a village, it takes a team. So we want to hear about a little bit what the U.S. is doing. So with that there, I want to, again, welcome everyone in the room, those of you online. Those of you online, you can submit questions on the little widget underneath this, the streaming. And I'd like to have you kick us off here. And we'll, we're getting your PowerPoint up. And do you want to, sp you'll speak from your seat? Yeah, which is fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. And those of you in the audience, you also think of questions. So you have no widget. You will ask them in a mic here. Thank you. So. Yeah, you could start up. Okay. She's. And Thank you very much, Jennifer, for uh, having me here and for inviting me to uh, integrate this like great panel. Thank you uh, for my colleagues to I don't know. Um, 
we I, I hope we, we had like a really insightful discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I wanna I really appreciate um, the invitation from the Wilson Center and also from the Heinrich Boll Stiftung um, Foundation. So I'm gonna focus on Chinese investments and financing in renewables and also lithium extraction in Argentina. Um, first of all, I want to start like just saying some things that I'm sure uh, you you really know, and this is. China's global investments and financing, including energy and lithium, like having a, a great impact after the acceleration of the of the global financial crisis in 2008, but mainly through through the BRI and through this sub program from the BRI that is the Green Belt, Belt and Road Initiative. So the focus on fi financing and also investing in in the global south, including countries in Latin America. Uh, you can say that there are like some sectors, like renewable sectors, uh, especially I'm going to focus in solar and wind projects, have uh, have been like really pushed uh, through investments, uh, Chinese investments, and also financing uh, in South America in particular. Ar Argentina, Brazil, and Chilean and Chile are are the main recipients of uh, investments and financing from Chinese companies and banks. Uh, also, there's a growing and really um, pushing interesting in critical minerals such as lithium. And in Latin America, for example, uh, particularly in the lithium tri triangle, uh, which is composed by Argentina, uh, Bolivia, and Chile, investments are really growing, especially in Argentina, but also in Chile. And there's a recent agreement regarding uh, a Bolivian, the Bolivian uh, national company that is Yacimientos um, de Litio Bolivianos and Chinese, uh, the Chinese, uh, a, a Chinese uh, consortium. So regarding especially or particularly Chinese investments and financing in, in, in Argentina and in an Argentinian solar sector, I just want to, to focus on the, in the sectors that are in the cases that have been like successful. The first of all, the, the first, the first one or the, the most important would be like the Cauchari Solar Park, that is the the biggest solar park that China has built in Latin America, and this has been like a joint venture between a, a, a company that is a province company in Argentina, and also Power China and Shanghai Electric. Uh, participating through an EPC contract that is uh, engineering pro uh, procurement and <laughs> construction contract. Uh, this uh, project has been financed by the Exim Bank and there's an agreement between China and, I mean, be the, between the Exim, the Exim, Exim Bank and um, the Argentinian government, particularly the, the, the provincial government, government of, of Jujuy to extend, to expand this uh, solar pal panel. And this is, uh, this would be just yes, uh, part of the BRI agreement because Ch uh, Argentina entered the BRI last year. The other, the other uh, um, solar park that, that uh, where Chinese uh, have like a really important participation is Iglesia uh, Guanyasuil. It's located in San Juan province. And there's another uh, solar park in Jafayate uh, in the province of Salta. Uh, these are, the, the last one is a case of, um, not a financing case, uh, not, a, not a case where where Chinese have been awarded in 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 binding in public binding, but uh, particularly through mer a merger acqui and acquisition uh, operation. So just to uh, for you to know, these contracts uh, where Chinese companies have been awarded in public tenders, you can find not just like direct part participation from Chinese companies, but also through like joint ventures or temporary joint ventures with local companies. And um, there's like the if the participation is not like directly, the um, uh, Chinese companies are also providing, of course, technologies such as panels and turbines for other projects, not only these projects. So regarding the solar, uh, the sorry, the wind sector, I just wanted you to show which are like the most relevant uh, cases. In this case. 
uh, Envision Energy also participated in, in public binding, um, in, bu in public tenders, and they won just uh, a lot of uh, tenders, but the, the, the parks that have been successful are Garcia del Rio and Vientos del Secano in, in Buenos Aires province. And also we have mergers and acquisitions, uh, mainly through Goldwyn's acquisitions of two parks, uh, sorry, five parks, one in the, pro in the province of Buenos Aires and uh, uh, the other four in, in the south part of Argentina in Patagonia. And now moving to the lithium sector, what just I wanted just to show you is that China has become like a leading uh, actor there. You can see like exports from China, from Argentina to like the leading countries. And you can say, and you can see there that China has moved from maybe the last five years, like really highing uh, or um, maybe like posing itself as a, as a leading country in terms of imports from uh, Argentina and regarding lithium. In the second place, you can see, um, of course, the United States and then South Korea, Japan and other, um, other actors. But in terms of uh, Argentina's mineral exports to China, 90, more than 98% of these uh, mineral exports are composed by lithium and 42% of, the li of this lithium uh, that Argentina is exporting to, to, the, to, to the world uh, is being capturated by China. So in this situation, it is like, like for me, it's like really important to, to focus in the, in the projects that are already operating in Argentina that are, are under operation. This means we have a US company, Phoenix. Uh, Phoenix project is led by the, the Livens company, US company, and, he, and has been producing lithium like for many years. Olaros is the other uh, project that is in operation. It's uh, led by a, like a joint venture between an Australian company, which is Alchem, a Japanese company with this Toyota and a local company that is uh, Hohoi's um, state-owned company. And the third one that has been just recently launched uh, is led by a, a consortium or a joint venture between Kanfeng, which has, which has the majority of the, of the states, uh, of, the of the stakes in the, in the, in the, um, sorry, in the project, and also a Canadian um, company and a local company. So uh, just to like take a look between um, regarding like the, the role of China and what Argentina is expected to 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 become in terms of lithium or to um, yeah um, Argentina is projected to to by uh, 2030 to sixfold its uh, current production of lithium carbonate. And more than a half uh, would be produced by projects that are leaded or that are have participation of Chinese companies. This is like uh, really interesting because now Argentina is the fourth uh, producer, uh, produ producer of lithium in the world, and this would come. Uh, this would like um, help Argen Argentina to be like the top three global lithium producer. Uh, and this is also because uh, the Chinese presence like, is like really important there. Just a few points uh, advancing, like going to maybe the conclusions or trying to, to figure out some distinctive uh, characteristics that, that China's co Chinese companies have in, in, the, in the lithium sector in Argentina. There are 35 projects uh, like in different uh, level of advance uh, in Argentina. Most of them are at, at, at advanced state. Most of the, com of the projects where Chinese companies are intervening are in advanced stages. That, that means that they have the building permits approved or the construction has, has really uh, has just started. And compared to other global companies, they are not just seeking profitability in the short or medium term, but they are controlling the battery grade lithium that plants under construction will produce just to, of course, to, uh, to, to do like the, the refining and the, the other phases of the other um, yeah, phases of the, of the 
um, supply chain uh, production regarding batteries, for example, uh, in China. So what they want to do is just not to to seek profitability in the in the short term, but to control the the battery grade lithium and 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 get it to to uh, just uh, refine it, right? Uh, the other, the other issue that th that is really important that uh, and that is really characteristical of, of Chinese presence in Argentina, it is uh, it, it begins with a small participation, but then uh, they the companies take control, majority of total of, of the totality of the stakes, uh, with almost like trying to like have exclusive presence uh, in the salt floods. That means that they are trying to, there are two cases in Argentina that have no neighbor projects, that they are like exclusive partici participation in the salt flood by controlling one or more projects, and both of them <laughs> are uh, Chinese companies. One of the projects is Mariana, controlled by Kanfeng, and the other one is Tres Quebradas, uh, that is uh, controlled by Xijin company. So these are, I just wanted to show you which are like the most advanced projects where Chinese companies are intervening in Argentina. And you can see there, uh, most of them have like the majority of the stakes in each project. The only case that we can say that there's no the majority is Centenario Ratones, which is uh, under control of a French company that is Eramet, but Xinxiang uh, providing financing there, they got the, the almost 50% of the of the stakes there. Some things that I, I wanted just to, to show here is that Mariana, for example, that is going to, to be like launched in a, in a very short time, uh, will be supplied by, by power provided by off-grid solar farms. So Chinese, what they are doing is they are investing also in solar plants just to some of them are going to provide solar energy to these plants. This is the case of Mariana. This is the case of uh, Tres Quebradas in, Cana in Catamarca, which has a, an agreement with, a, a, with Power China to construct four pl uh, power plants, solar farms there, and one of them will uh, supply um, Tres Quebradas project. Um, and just to, to go to the conclusions, some of the findings that, that I've been, um, that I found <laughs> um, doing uh, research about Chinese companies in Argentina's renewables, but also in the lithium sector, is that the, there's a multi-level engagement. Uh, Chinese companies are not only uh, like dealing or having uh, really close relationships with the national government, but also with provincial and local governments. This is like really particular because we don't see this like this is not happening as the CC uh, like in these terms in uh, regarding, for example, other global companies, especially uh, U.S. companies. Uh, also, they have been like really successful in terms of channeling uh, state-owned and private companies' investments to uh, strategic projects. They have been like really smart, not only through mergers and acquisitions, but uh, because they have like, a lot of financing from from Chinese banks, not only development banks, but also commercial banks. And some challenges that I that I see for the future regarding China and Argentina partnerships are uh, this is more like a domestic thing, but there's a lack of coordination between Argentina's government, a uh, national government or state government, and and the provinces. Provinces are doing like their own game, and they just have like really close relationships with Chinese counterparts. And th there's like a, a, a really big lack of coordination there. There's uh, an absence in Argentina of a long-term plan regarding the energy and uh, how to promote development. And when I talked about when I talk about development, I'm not talk talking about only about economic development, but also sustainable development. Argentina is like. Uh, in my perspective, uh, having like really tremendous challenges regarding how to address social and environmental impacts of lithium extraction, in particular. Um, the, the maybe the, the most uh, important challenge would be to, to how to require more value added to be located in the country. Mm -hmm. 
because most of the of the projects there are, there's a, there are lots of agreements uh, regarding like industrialization and but the 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 real thing that is happening is that uh, Chinese companies are taking the, the 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 lithium carbonate and they are not processing it in uh, in Argentina so we have a, a really big issue there thank you very much okay Sorry thank you so much let's give some applause mm -hmm. that, was, that was wonderful and Kate, I think you're, you're just no PowerPoint, right? No PowerPoint. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. A little mixture. Great. Here. So yeah, um, please. Well, thanks so much, Jennifer, for inviting me to speak here today. As Jennifer mentioned, I'm Kate Logan. I'm with the Asia Society Policy Institute. So we are a think and do tank affiliated with the Asia Society, um, the much broader organization that's headquartered in New York. Um, and it's been around since John D. Rockefeller founded it in the 1950s. Um, so I'll be sharing some of the key findings of an initiative that we've been running um, for about the past year focused on China's cooperation with Southeast Asia to accelerate the clean energy transition specifically in five countries. Um, so a little bit more of a macro picture, um, but I will zoom into some case studies and focus specifically on some of the challenges that are being seen by Chinese investors in terms of shifting investment from dirty sources such as coal-fired coal power plants um, into clean energy, which is a very different environment. Um, so the, the countries that we've been focusing on are Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, and the Philippines. And I also particularly want to thank my colleague, Mu Yi Yang, uh, who's based in Australia at the Asia Society Policy Institute office there, who's been leading this initiative and really helped to inform some of the points that I'll be making here today, um, as well as all of the experts that have been involved in those dialogues, because this is really building on their own views, expertise that they've shared throughout some of those dialogues um, and some of the, the key points that have come to the surface that we're trying to figure out how to best address through recommendations. And I think the recommendations that we've been finding are also applicable not just to Chinese financiers, but also the broader set of financiers as well. So I think that's something that we can possibly bring into the discussion later. Um, so just to, to frame this shift in Southeast Asia from uh, sort of coal and fossil fuels toward clean, um, so the fundamental challenge here in terms of investing in renewable energy is that the power sector has long been set up for um, fossil fuels and particularly coal-fired power plants. So in 2020, about 80% of electricity generation in Southeast Asia was from coal-fired power specifically. Um, so on one hand, the dominance of coal-fired power for a long time was a cheap source of energy. Um, it was readily available. Obviously, it has a degree of stability, but a lot of negative externalities, especially for health consequences. Um, just to mention the Indonesia air pollution um, challenges that have sort of risen to the surface as one example of that. And with my own background, having sort of been in China during a lot of the um, movement to better control air pollution, I think there's a lot of similarities in terms of transboundary air pollution coming from coal around big cities and some of the challenges in addressing that. Um, and then obviously coal-fired power plants are um, you know, one of the key drivers of climate change globally, and there's been a lot of movement to um, phase down coal power and um, more broadly than that on fossil fuels as well for that reason. Um, so in recent years, one of the key advancements was at the UN General Assembly in 2021 um, when Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, made the announcement that China would no longer um, build new coal power abroad. Um, since then, that uh, there's been a lot of groups sort of tracking the implementation of what that's looked like in practice, um, something I'm happy to get into as well. But um, that was a big advancement in terms of sort of cutting one of the big sources of finance for coal power. Um, and around the same time, both Japan and Korea made similar commitments um, as well. So that's one of the sort of, you know, um, uh, financier side factors for on the, the coal side. And then um, from a host country side, uh, that aligned very much with the movement to adopt net zero targets. So in Southeast Asia, pretty much every country has a net zero target almost. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, countries have adopted renewable energy generation targets, um, many of which are actually included in countries' nationally determined contributions uh, that they submit to the UN under the Paris Agreement. But if not at that level, um, at least integrated into their um, sort of midterm power sector planning um, documents. Um, so I have a number of examples of this. I think we probably don't have time to go into each one in detail, um, but that's been a key driver in terms of setting concrete quantitative targets um, from the poll side in terms of creating an incentive for more investment in renewable energy at the same time that the finance for fossil fuels is sort of cut off. 
Um, but the key issue that we come to at this point is that the power sector, again, has been set up um, not necessarily to integrate renewables very easily. Um, and in order to turn this momentum into actual results, we need to solve a lot of these challenges. And one of the, the challenges that's really risen to the top is just the quantity of finance that is needed. Um, so to put this into perspective, about uh, U.S. $40 billion per year is needed by 2030 um, to facilitate Southeast Asia's um, transition to clean energy. Um, and that, in comparison, um, in terms of why we're focusing also on sort of activating private finance, between 2016 and 2020, about 20 billion total for all public finance for the power sector was provided in the region. Um, so that's about half what, of what is needed annually by 2030 just for, for clean energy. Um, so a lot of the discussion has very much focused on mobilizing private investment in clean energy projects in Southeast Asian countries. Um, so now come, we come to some of the, the current barriers for investment in renewable energy in the region. Um, so the, the key issue, obviously, is the bankability projects and how to create um, projects that uh, are um, you know, attractive to investors that are risk averse um, and address some of the issues so that private sectors or private investors are actually interested in investing in the region. Um, so I'll overview some of these and then I'm going to give two case examples of Vietnam and Indonesia specifically um, that I think are quite interesting and sort of illustrating what this looks like in practice. Um, but just at a macro level, uh, some of the key issues are inadequate planning practices, given that the power sector was originally designed for baseload sources like thermal and hydropower. Um, substantial difficulties in acquiring the land necessary for renewable in some countries, um, and that's led to some innovation in some areas such as floating uh, solar offshore wind, um, which are you know quite attractive going forward, but still quite risky and quite nascent at the same time. Um, complex and non-transparent permitting processes that involve a lot of agencies, a lot of overlapping responsibility, so it's very unclear, um, especially from an investment standpoint, who's responsible for some of the roles within that process. Um, also issues with power purchase agreements, um, providing predictable revenues for projects. So when you look at the, you know, about 20-year tenor for a lot of these um, projects and agreements, uh, you know, will you be able to uh, get the finance that you're integrating into your financial modeling when you're looking at it um, at the outset. Um, and then finally, sort of related to that, concerns about the financial health of national electric utilities uh, and their ability to fulfill some of their payment obligations um, through things like feed-in tariffs or um, other mechanisms that are aiming to incentivize renewable energy. Uh, so these are some of the sort of you know, like specific issues in the power sector. And then when you take that out to a broader macro level, um, they're compounded by some of the issues such as restrictions on foreign direct investment or unclear guidance for foreign direct investment, uh, currency risks, and then also um, obviously debt distress in some of these countries, uh, and then weaknesses in the local banking system and capital markets. So uh, the fundamental challenge here, as I keep stressing, is to improve the power sector's foundational architecture um, so that it better incentivizes investment in renewable energy um, so that it's not just depending on concessional public finance, but also private finance can be tapped into, um, including from Chinese sources. And again, I'm raising these issues in the context of China-Southeast Asia discussion, so um, that's where they've been raised, but obviously they're much uh, more broadly applicable than that. Um, and then the issue that I'll sort of come to after I give the case examples is this chicken or egg question where, on one hand, you need reforms, um, you need to implement um, different architecture in the power sector, but at the same time, a lot of the countries want to see concrete results in the near term, and they're hesitant to invest in what is a long and risky um, and difficult process of implementing some of these policy reforms um, until they see results, and that's led to a lot of inertia in terms of what where to go next. Um, so just to give two case examples, um, the first one being Vietnam, uh, is looking at how Vietnam has really led uh, in terms of solar PV deployment, uh, but that has been challenged by curtailment um, for all the sol solar that has been deployed. Um, so Vietnam has sort of been seen as this model of success um, within the ASEAN region for solar. Um, and by the end of 2020, the total installed capacity reached 16.5 gigawatts, um, which was almost 160% of what it was in 2018. The key driver of this is Vietnam adopted a highly favorable feed-in tariff um, that was a huge incentive for investment in solar within the region. 
um, and by uh, this burst of growth, uh, Vietnam ends up basically comprising about 70% of installed, I think, I think that's grid scale um, solar within the region. Um, so there's massive growth, but then the challenge there is that much of this solar is concentrated in regions where it's feeding into the transmission that then goes to the industrial zones, particularly around Ho Chi Minh City, which are really the manufacturing centers of a lot of industry in Vietnam. Um, but the infrastructure and grid infrastructure in particular is not set up to handle that intermittency in terms of a new source. Um, so there's been very high rates of curtailment. Um, and to give one example, the curtailment rate at Vietnam's largest solar PV plant, which has a capacity of 450 megawatts, so almost half a gigawatt, that's you know incredible scale, um, was as high as 40%. Um, so this means that 40% of the energy that's actually being produced by renewable source is not actually making it to the grid and then the factories. Um, so the key challenge there is how to um, you know build out the grid infrastructure and set up the grid such that it can handle um, this new source of power at speed and at scale. Um, a second, Indo second example, um, just to give uh, another um, sort of illustration, is Indonesia. Um, and in this case, uh, it's more an issue of lock-in uh, limiting the, the scope for renewable energy development. And what I mean by this is back in uh, 2015, the Indonesian government adopted a plan um, that it started rolling out to massively expand the capacity of the power sector. Um, but at the time, the projected growth in energy demand um, was much higher than what it ended up being in practice. Um, and at the same time, they prioritized thermal sources early on. So this led to a lot of build out of, um, you know, again, back in, in 2015, coal fired power plants, other large thermal sources um, that basically constrained the space that's left over for renewable energy. Um, and at the same time, uh, the actual rate in terms of the increase of electricity demand um, was about half of what they had predicted. Mm -hmm. um, so they're building out massive power sector capacity, and a lot of that electricity is not actually being used in practice, and then also that new capacity is being taken up primarily by fossil fuel sources. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of shift in Indonesia. We can get into some of the more recent developments, including from the U.S. side with the um, Just Energy Transition Partnership, which is a really interesting model, um, I think, for the discussion as well and sort of the interplay uh, between different sources of finance and, and policy uh, change factors. But um, in terms of the, the lock-in, that's been a, a key challenge um, in terms of leading to Indonesia's um, state-owned utility, PLN, being financially stretched and basically unable to undertake the grid updates and improvements in support of green power um, that are needed because they're stuck basically paying out these power purchase agreements to the fossil fuel sources. Um, so I've talked a lot about ch challenges. I do want to end <laughs> with uh, some of our you thoughts on solutions. Us. Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> um, so going back to China and China's role within the region, uh, to put this in context, uh, between 2000 and 2022, um, China's invested in a total of around 168 gigawatts of power sources globally, and this is according to data collected from um, our friends at Boston University's Global Development Policy Center, um, who run really, really useful data bases on um, a lot of these investments, and about 30% of that has gone toward Southeast Asia. So within the top 10 countries for investment, I think four of those are in Southeast Asia in terms of China's um, global energy investments. So just to touch on a couple of ideas, again, I talked about this chicken or egg question earlier and how to break through that, and that's been a focal point of a lot of, um, you know, sort of the, the discussions we've had. Uh, one is partnering with Southeast Asian countries to develop pilot projects that showcase the benefits of the transition um, and using that to sort of create models that can then be scaled up. Um, second is more focused capacity building support and especially learning from China's practice. China has dealt with widespread curtailment in its own renewable energy rollout. Um, there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from that experience. Um, third is sort of this China Plus approach um, in terms of co-financing with other international and local partners, um, and that's something we can talk more about later on. Um, and then finally, um, supporting clean industry development beyond just the electricity itself. And um, one of the issues I didn't touch on, for instance, is that Indonesia has also um, a high domestic content requirement um, asking for a lot of the solar to be produced locally in Indonesia, um, which obviously would be a tremendous economic driver, um, but that domestic manufacturing industry for solar still uh, will take time to build up. So 
Um, these are just some of the ideas we've discussed. I think I will leave it there for now. So we have uh, more to discuss uh, during the, the but Q&A. But just one, one yeah. insert. Mm-hmm. But, but to date, most of China's investment in these countries has been fossil fuel. Yes, exactly. Um, and if I didn't make that clear, that, I just, you know, want, that I just, just want to just underline that. Off of a long history, and we're really focused on sort of the, the solution oriented, um, you know, what to do after the big 2021 announcement and in the shifting environment um, and, and how to make that move faster. And I know we're going to the Q&A, but I know that, that you and I talked, even in Latin America, coal, coal has been king too with Chinese investment. Not coal, but yeah, uh, oil and gas. Oil and gas. Okay, so fossil yeah, fuels. All right. <laughs> just want to make, get that done. All right, so here you go, Jacqueline, <laughs> passing the mic to you. Tell us your story. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you to the Wilson Center and um, all the sponsors for this event. Um, I guess I come to this conversation from a kind of U.S. government perspective um, and really to just kind of shed light on some of what we are doing um, within the clean energy space and also how we're looking at the transition for for developing countries. Um, I am Jacqueline Musitwa and I'm a senior climate finance advisor at USAID. Um, And my portfolio is really to lead our charge on mobilizing 150 billion of public and private climate finance Mm -hmm. by 2030. So no no small feat there. (laughs) Um, As part of our climate strategy, we also do have um, other pretty big goals. For instance, um, supporting 500 million people to become more climate resilient, Um, as well as protecting 100 million hectares um, of forest land, um, reducing carbon emissions by 6 billion um, metric tons. So all of these together uh, within our climate strategy are part of the broader um, U.S. government um, approach to um, climate and, and climate ambitions. Now, I guess the question is, you know, how, how does USAID work within the space? Um, I think going back to my colleagues' uh, points on the enabling environment, that's one of the areas where we see our distinct um, opportunity and really supporting countries all over the world to improve um, not only their legislative frameworks, um, but also how they are able to engage contractually with foreign investors coming in within the energy space. An area where USAID has been particularly strong has been supporting countries on renewable energy auctions and really providing greater transparency um, with respect to um, pricing of such transactions. Um, Our colleagues at um, the United States Trade and Development Agency also focus on improved procurement um, within developing countries. So for us, it's, you know, there's a USAID component, but there is also a full a uh, whole of government approach into how we are supporting countries to eventually get to their broader climate um, goals. Another area that my team is particularly interested in and working really hard on is really around financial innovation. So Kate mentioned um, the Just Energy Transition Partnerships. Um, we're taking it from the perspective of how can we provide uh, blended finance How can we use our own money, which is grant money, um, U.S. government's grant money, and really use that to attract private capital? I think Kate did a great job of listing a lot of the challenges, and those challenges in Asia are very similar to Africa, similar to Latin America. And so the question here we're kind of trying to solve with respect to finance is, Um, How do we make this a collective responsibility, not just a public one, but really making sure that the private sector um, is able to come in? And we see our role there as really de-risking transactions and providing the opportunity for them to see value of investing in developing countries. I think another way that we engage is really um, partnership and co-investment with other donor countries. Um, but also with the large climate funds, so um, Green Climate Fund, for instance. Um, I'll shift a bit and also just kind of talk about, you know, how how we see our engagement, at least with Africa in particular. Uh, We look at it as a partnership and really acknowledge the fact that there is African agency in deciding how they determine um, their energy transition. 
Um, and so for us, you know, that partnership looks like um, a localization agenda. So we do have a localization policy by which, you know, by 2025, 25% of our funds will be managed by local partners in the countries we operate in. And by 2030, it is 50% of decision-making co-creation on projects will actually be with partners on the ground. That's really a testament to us saying, you know, it's not about a U.S. approach. It really is about people in the countries that they live, really determining what b works best for their own development trajectory. Mm -hmm. And we see that as, you know, a defining, uh, a, a difference in the U.S. approach compared to other um, investors and development partners approaches. Um, I think other aspects that I think are just kind of um, important to highlight, um, and at least going down to a country level, is from a just energy transition partnership perspective, you know, the U.S. government made a commitment um, with other governments, including the U.K. and others, um, to fund how countries shift from coal to renewable energy. Uh, I'm involved um, in our work in South Africa on the Just Energy Transition Partnership there, so that's kind of where I'll focus my remarks. Um, I think just some of the lessons learned so far is that um, there is kind of this balancing act between short and long-term priorities. And I think it's really important as we enter this new development model, so to say, that we recognize that you know countries are balancing a lot post-COVID um, and other crises that they're dealing with. And so in South Africa in particular, after um, the after kind of getting into the jet P transition, um, let's just say that there has been increased load shedding um, over the past two and a half years. And so the government there is balancing what do they do to provide power now versus what do they do um, as far as their plans for long term um, decommissioning of coal plants. Um, I think going back to Kate's point on utilities, which I also think is quite important, how do you look at utility reform over the long term? It's not something that can be done overnight. So as we look at supporting these transitions, it's also important just to realize that utility reform and decoupling of transmission, um, distribution and the like will take a lot of time. I think another aspect just observing the South African Jet P um, conversation is really that there is a lot of interest from a number of donors. Um, most of the donors that are um, kind of getting together to really find solutions are focusing on the aspect of just. What does it mean for people in mining communities in South Africa in particular in the province of Mpumalanga that have been reliant on coal for jobs, coal for processing? And so the question is, what next? What are we doing um, to really support this transition? Uh, what we haven't really seen as far as engagement in the Jet P conversations or really supporting the next stage of development for mining communities is the participation of China, for instance. So it really has been a conversation that has really been dominated by Europe and the U.S., um, and we just haven't, we haven't really seen what next, at least from a Chinese, um, a, a Chinese perspective. And so whilst China is no longer necessarily investing in coal mines, the question is, what are we all doing collectively with the, with the phase out process? I think some other observations, at least from an Africa perspective, that are relevant to this conversation and just jumping on my colleagues is, um, in a lot of African countries, the shift to solar has really kind of um, increased over the past couple of years, not only because of price, uh, but also efficiency. Now, China has been heavily involved within kind of the larger infrastructure projects, but what we're also seeing is at a smaller scale, um, which is also very critical just considering um, where the buying power of a majority of Africans is, which is uh, small ho solar home systems, is there's a bit of a crisis going on, in part because there's been a lot of dumping, um, a lot of it which has been sourced to Chinese companies, cheap products coming into the market, which sounds good, but then there's a question around quality. And um, all these products get into the market, people buy them, quality is low, you know, there, there are issues there, which it ends up kind of um, reducing the level of trust in um, solar home systems. I think the other aspect of the conversation there is just around the lack of circularity. Um, these products are coming in, 
No one knows what the length of the life of the product is. No one knows what the disposal will be. And so we also risk having, you know, this kind of e-waste problem that is coming. And that's one that we're not necessarily um, planning for just yet. Related to that is just kind of a skills transfer issue. Um, I think a lot of the technologies that are coming in are coming in and being planted. Um, and it's not necessarily being used to grow um, local talent. So once again, there continues to be this reliance, um, at least on Chinese knowledge um, and skills to continue to fix, refurbish um, technologies that are in the market. Um, now, as of, I think it was earlier this year, there's an initiative by the Chinese si uh, Solar Association and some philanthropies to start to shift uh, production to African countries and start to work on skills transfer. So hopefully that will be an avenue now for Africans really to increase um, their own skills and ability to work a lot of this technology. If not, once again, I fear that we risk putting Africans in a continuous position of waiting um, and not necessarily being at the forefront of their own um, development. I think two other um, trends I think that, that we're also seeing is um, Chinese investment in regional development banks. So in the case of Africa, it's investment in Afrexim Bank, for instance, which is the largest import-export bank on the continent, investment in trade and development bank, investment in African Development Bank. And so you're seeing that a lot of money is going into regional organizations, which is then also prioritizing and focusing on regional um, energy projects. Uh, but also other regional um, development projects. And we're not necessarily seeing that trend uh, with, with other countries as much. Now, I think uh, the other thing that I was going to say as far as trends is we are noticing kind of a decline in the number of resource for infrastructure contracts. Um, there was a trend, I would say, what, 10, 15 years ago, as we saw in DRC, and other countries where the Chinese would go in and say, we will help you build infrastructure for a percentage ownership in a particular mine or you know, resource. Um, and I think as countries have evolved and understood kind of what the terms were, um, there has been kind of a tendency to renegotiate. And I see this being a trend in the future where African governments are stopping and taking stock of what has happened and really questioning what development benefits have come out and really saying, let's stop, let's reevaluate, how can we do this better in the future? So I think going back to my point on agency, I do see more African governments really starting to increase their own capacity and also challenging a lot of the contracts that they signed previously. Um, the last um, trend I think that I think is worrying um, and I don't have a solution to is really around fossil fuel subsidies. Um, mm. There was a recent report that came out by the IMF that you know we collectively, the world, are you know paying seven trillion uh, for fossil fuel subsidies, which is two trillion more than you know two three years ago. And African countries are no exception. We saw you know Nigeria recently um, you know remove fossil fuel subsidies. We're hearing the same um, sentiment from a lot of African governments saying we're paying too much, but we're not there yet. So the result is that governments are spending money on fossil fuel subsidies that they could be spending on renewable energy, that they could be spending on social services. And so something that I think is important as we have this dialogue about clean energy is really also looking at kind of where governments are putting their money and really trying to find ways to make it more practical for development outcomes. Uh, rather than um, corporate outcomes. Um, the last one, not necessarily related to energy, but another trend that we're seeing um, is really within carbon markets. So this shift from you know just clean energy and we're now looking at natural climate solutions um, and China joining other countries such as the <laughs> UAE, Saudi Arabia, really uh, leasing large swaths of lands of countries uh, for carbon credits. This week, the announcement was about 5% of Zambia 
Um, uh, the Zambian government got into an agreement with a Chinese company for about 5% of Zambian landmass to focus on carbon. In the case of Liberia, the contract is with uh, a company from the UAE focused on 10% of the landmass. And so as those transactions happen, you know, I, I, I do question whether we have sufficiently learned lessons from renewable energy, of which there are many lessons, and whether we are applying that to new types of investments that are coming up in the continent. So I'll stop on you know, what, what gives me hope. Um, I was in Nairobi last week for the Africa Climate Summit, and one of the results of um, the conversations there was African countries coming up with what has been termed the Nairobi Declaration, really reiterating um, a lot of areas where they would like to get support from the global community, but also where they plan to focus on. And with respect to this conversation, there's definitely a focus in that document on the push for clean energy, which I think is quite encouraging. Even though countries might also want to explore what to do with their gas resources, there's a recognition that that is time bound, that is a transition fuel, and so the goal is how do we get to renewables. Another aspect, and I think just jumping off um, both Juliana and Kate's comments is really on processing of minerals. You know, a majority of um, critical minerals are on the continent, whether we're talking about vanadium, cobalt, you know, we can go graphite, copper, we can go down the <laughs> list. Um, but within the Nairobi Declaration, there was a point in there that was really encouraging of African countries to look at how to process uh, materials locally and provide value add before exporting. And if indeed African countries follow through with that, then I think the conversation we're having about clean energy will significantly shift because it will shift the dynamics of a world where we are reliant on Africa for raw materials to now making sure that production and industrialization happen in different African countries. So that's one that you know is, is, is in the works and we will see how that happens. But from a USAID perspective, just to conclude, you know, we are once again supportive of, you know, the African intention to, you know, localize, um, um, can I say, manufacturing, but also keeping in mind that we do support um, improved labor conditions, human rights, and making sure that mining of the future and where we get our, uh, our, our, our minerals and materials is done in a better way. And mining in a better way, unfortunately, is not always the conversation we have when we're talking about clean energy. We're not necessarily looking at it from the vantage point of people in mining communities. We're looking at it as far as you know our laws and where we can get our next EV. But there's still a lot, I think, that needs to be done as far as improving the enabling environment and improving the operating environment of the mines that are supplying us with the critical materials we need to have um, a green economy. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. You guys think of your question for so I have a few, it's like, so rich, where do I start? <laughs> but obviously, when the last person talks, they get like the first question, because we remember. The, this last bit, where and which um, Juliana mentioned it too, about the, the localizing the actual processing, but also I like, I pr appreciate that you brought up the issue of, the, of the, the health and safety of the mining communities. First of all, for you, in, is USAID or is there anyone engaged, you know, is there some examples of pilot projects that are that are working to help build the capacity of some country that you've been, that you're operating in to, to do this? Are there is there any steps in those directions or is it just intention right now? No, so uh, we've done a lot in the artisanal mining space in DRC in particular and really working at the local level on rights. Um, but also improving um, miners' mining conditions. Um, I think in addition to that, um, we do work across different countries. We've done this in countries like Zambia as far as supporting the legal and enabling environment to make it more, um, can I say, people and environment friendly um, as you know, Zambia looks to roll out even more copper. Uh, we are also, we as the USG, also supporting the collaboration of processing of copper between the DRC and Zambia. So there are a lot of steps that you know are being taken at the USAID level, but equally at the USG level, recognizing that you know partnership with African countries is inevitable if we are going to get to our own respective um, climate goals here. 
And also maybe our European partners also working in a similar vein. I mean, is there any is there any coordination with you guys, kind of in trying to make sure that that these efforts get can, can be scaled up? Because I said one one villager isn't enough. There are uh, there are global conversations happening between partners and really trying to find allies to work together towards these goals. So yes, it's not only the US, it's not only Europe, um, but once again, coordination takes time and planning, and so that is one that is is in the works. Um, I think it's worth following conversations around um, G20, you know, that recently mm -hmm. happened, because there is definitely a focus from that group, especially now that the African Union is a member, um, of really making sure that we do strengthen supply chains around critical minerals. What about in, in Argentina? Because you did mention at the very end about how, you know, I mean, you guys want, Argentina wants to do more of their own processing of, of the lithium mines. But what about in terms, let's talk first about the safety, the environment, you said the environment and the social impact assessments and the laws aren't strong enough. Is, is there some movement either in the NGO or outside that's going to, that can be helping Argentina be safer for these miners? Because you've just said, I mean, your numbers were jaw-dropping <laughs> on how much you guys are going to be number three in the world of lithium. There are a lot of, like, discussion in terms of NGOs um, push for rights uh, regarding the, the, com the local communities. Local communities are, like, really worried about, like, access uh, to water, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is not like a broad discussion in Argentina. This is like really worrying, like me and other experts, because they are just being maybe uh, silenced. Um, the impacts of of how lithium extraction is going to to have uh, like a really big. Uh, it's going to be like a really big issue in maybe 10 years is not really understood still mm. uh, communities are not involved in previous consultation or not as involved as, uh, as they should be they are they are not part of uh, of like conversations where they can receive the the information that they need regarding how they are being going to be, how they are going to be affected in terms of access to water, but also also because they are being like, you know, trying to be moved to other places. Mm -hmm. So NGOs are yes really worried, and also environmental uh, the environmental press, but there I think there's a lot to do because local governments are doing like a great job to silence these voices. Which doesn't, yeah. yeah, that's that's not. <laughs> you've heard, you've seen and heard this before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what um, what about um, I don't know how deeply you've dove into the the critical or rare earth mining issues in, yeah. in Southeast Asia. I so mean, I was going to bring up the example of Indonesia and yeah. nickel processing, which I think is also a really interesting example, um, touching on the interplay between um, Chinese investment and sort of localization of, of processing. So. Indonesia has adopted policies um, banning the export of nickel in order to incentivize more local processing and just sort of touching on another initiative that I've run at ASPE. We have a high-level policy commission focused on getting Asian net zero that conducted research looking at um, the impact of Indonesia's net zero targets if they play out on its uh, economic and social development. And broadly, um, if those targets are achieved, it will be positive um, for economic development, increasing GDP above baseline significantly, but obviously the challenge, and also employment, um, but the challenge there is that many jobs will be lost in fossil fuel sectors. Um, so in terms of how do you address that through just transition, um, one of the key solutions is by localizing clean industries that provide jobs for former fossil fuel workers, but obviously this is much more challenging in practice than not. But um, in theory, the localization of nickel processing can be a really um, strong mechanism for um, you know, providing a lot of jobs, but obviously right now, nickel processing is still a very dirty industry. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, one of the challenges is that a lot of the nickel processing plants use captive power sources, which are still currently coal. Mm -hmm. um, when I did analysis of Chinese invested coal plants in Indonesia, I think around 2020, 
um, the largest uh, capacity coal plant investment was, um, I think, at the Singchen, uh, Singchen um, uh, nickel plant uh, in the Morawali um, investment zone in Indonesia. So um, basically right now in terms of going forward, how do you create a stable source of power for an industrial zone? Um, and geothermal is one option. Um, there are other options as well. Um, while also enabling that localization of the, the processing, which is also really important. So I think, you know, there is room if the incentives are there um, to figure out cleaner sources of energy, um, but there's still challenges in that regard as well. I mean, I, I mm -hmm. but I know so in Indonesia, I, I've, I've heard word, and I don't know if you know, if you can help ground truth this, that because Indonesia has a lot of coal <laughs> and the mm -hmm. idea of like, it's like no more Chinese finance coal fired power plant, that was, they, it was a hard hit for them. But I've heard that there's some movement of maybe doing coal gasification, that while that's, that's officially not coal-fired power, but it's not really in the spirit. Do you know if these coal gasification projects, have you heard in anywhere in the region that, because I've heard that Chinese might be in, because the, the local countries want them, like Indonesia. Yeah, I mean, I don't have the latest data or statistics on that um, in Indonesia or specific countries, but I think it's interesting to look at, for instance, um, China's background in terms of their, I think around 2015, being a large shift in terms of like planning a lot of coal gasification projects. Um, but those projects are very expensive. They're not cost competitive and they'll be to stranded assets. And that actually led to China sort of walking back on that. Um, because some the of them time. need a lot of water as well, which is yeah, also exactly. kind of a risk they're, factor. They're stressing on resources as well. Um, but it is a question in terms of how do you provide the alternate engine of growth. And I think this is why investing in clean energy manufacturing and other industries that do create local jobs in clean industries is really important. And I think you know, China has a, a internal motiv intrinsic motivation in terms of being part of that foreign direct investment um, as they grow their footprint. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one more question? Oh, well, mm -hmm. well, okay, we'll, go, we'll get the audience. Okay, um, uh, Jurian, can you pass it here? Mm -hmm. And just say your name briefly and, and let's have succinct questions. I'll gather two questions. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Oh, wait, wait the, is the, did you flip it on? Sorry. Make sure you flick the bottom on, Dunning, Dunning on the bottom. Hi. It's on now, I think. Thanks. Uh, Michael Hughes from the Hogan Institute, and I'm a, a state ethical and legal planner, and it came out extraordinary because some of my, my, my questions were kind of based on my experience there at that one solution that I worked on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But first, for, uh, for Juliana, are, is the US, uh, are we putting conditions on our engagement in trying to help these countries transition uh, that are, are causing Latin American Um, I think that the, the discussion that the PRC is engaging uh, governments at the local level and kind of, I, I would suggest that's getting involved in politics and trying to help people win at the local level. Um, and maybe we're missing out on that. Would, would you recommend one way or the other way, way to redo this? Question? By we, you mean the U.S.? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good. Well, why don't we go down the line? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to start? Yeah. Thank you for your question. I don't know if to just say conditions, but the thing is that U state companies are not fond of like macro macroeconomic crises or political instabilities in the region. So uh, I'm more focused in the case of Argentina, and Argentina I is like really. Uh, I mean, the Chinese companies are really willing to take some risks, or most of the risks <laughs> that and, and, and notably are not make profit. That's what's yeah. really striking. <laughs> so they are just thinking in a long-term way, and that is like maybe the the most significant condition that you find there. Mm -hmm. Kate, sure. So I think one of the um, aspects to look at again is Chinese investment I'm just touching on the the manufacturing industries there's actually an interesting recent study coming out of Boston University as well looking at 
whether the shift in solar supply chains to Southeast Asia had any substantive impact on renewable energy deployment in those countries' uh, electricity grids. And the answer was no, it does not at this point in time. So I think when you look at you know Chinese local involvement, there's investment in manufacturing that I think there might be a gap, say, between Chinese investment and maybe investment coming from uh, the United States and other members of the G7 or the Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment um, that I keep mentioning is something I think that's that's uh, really important going forward. But I would say on the other hand that when you look at local level engagement and capacity building, it's probably much stronger right now um, on sort of the, the PGII side. Um, but, you know, there's still a considerable gap there in terms of reconciling that. I think it's also interesting to look at opportunities for collaboration and uh, you know, potential co-financing, noting the difficult geopolitics at the moment. Um, but the U.S. and China are, um, you know, so when uh, Janet Yellen went to China, um, to Beijing in early July, she did host a dialogue on um, U.S., China and climate finance. And, you know, that dialogue is happening. Um, and I think that regardless of whether co-financing goes forth, and again, our friends at BU who put out lots of great research have found that Chinese projects that are co-financed have um, a higher degree of adherence with standards and better outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you don't see co-financing, I think even just having those conversations are really important because any sort of policy change hypothetically can then lead to better, more favorable environments for renewable and clean energy investments across the board and hopefully raise standards as well. Um, just want to interject a yeah. question on this. With with the so with the renewables that, that China's investing in, they're not, as you, you commented, they're not bringing in, I mean, it's expensive. I mean, they have an amazing grid. I mean, their, their grid system, it's, I mean, high power, and it, and it used to have curtailment, not as much anymore. Yeah. Are the Chinese helping these countries in, in building grid infrastructure, or is is anyone? Also wondering, even in the African continent, is because that's also a a challenge to because you you can't unless you're going to focus on microgrids. So yeah, I mean, my understanding is that's still a key gap as well, and I sort of touched on that a little bit in some of the the case studies that I gave. Um, I think the last thing I just say on the um, in response is that obviously the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act and sort of this shift toward trying to bring manufacturing back to the United States perhaps has had an impact, and I know there are um, you know like efforts to attempt to sort of bring more partner countries into supply chains and, and friend shoring, but there's certainly a tension there as well. Um, so I think that's something to, to keep into consideration. Mm. Uh, thanks. Um, I, I think just adding on the last point about, you know, key gaps, at least from an Africa perspective, post-COVID, um, a lot of countries experiencing financial distress there is also a notable decline in Chinese investment in large infrastructure. And the shift is from large infrastructure, interestingly, into digital infrastructure. So I think the next trend is really kind of the digital silk road and how China is really um, focusing on um, the role of technology in, in Africa's growth. Having said that, for me, it's also kind of a sad situation because um, about two, almost three decades ago, as China was working on its grid, one of the countries that they went to visit um, because that infrastructure was so admired was South Africa. And now there's kind of this reverse going on where there are South African delegations going to China really trying to learn from them. And so I think that there's also kind of this um, l lesson to be learned there and really just kind of maintaining technology, investing in infrastructure, and if you don't do it, you know, ev eventually things fall down. But I think your other, I think the question around local engagement in China is an interesting one because at least my experience, uh, having spent time in the mining sector, is it's not only national engagement or kind of provincial engagement, it goes down all the way to the traditional leaders and really doing what's necessary to get the respective concession. If it means sitting down on a ground, if it means drinking a local brew, a lot of Chinese, um, a lot of Chinese business people at least are willing to do whatever it takes. Um, and so, uh, which is I think a very different approach to let's sit down in a boardroom and negotiate. And when it does come to large scale mining concessions where there are host communities that have small parcels of land and getting that conversation, honestly, there's only, there is a limitation of how much you can do in a boardroom, which is why we end up seeing a lot of the land disputes later and local communities contesting that is because 
consultation as we know it in this context is not consultation as they need it, right? Consultation when you're trying to talk about someone's grandparents that were buried or a religious site, you know, can't necessarily be done in a certain format. Um, and so I think one, one of the challenges I had when I was in the mining sectors would go to a host community and a chief would say, I'm happy to have the conversation, but you need to bring a cow to slaughter. And we're sitting there kind of going, okay, how do we, do, like, uh, what, uh, how do we even do that, right? Um, and so, and a lot of those barriers, can I say, that we faced, um, you know, Chinese companies didn't really see those as barriers. It was a way, it was a price of, of doing business. I think your last question around the just. Honestly, I think this is one that is still evolving. The conversations around just and the just movement came out of the labor unions. And so there is still strong collaboration with labor and really trying to get this balance right. But we're not there yet. So whether it's conversations with international labor organization coming in, um, multiple stakeholder engagements virtually, in person, at the community level, at the municipality level, all of these are happening, but they're happening at a slower pace, can I say, than the people who planned these structures. And so I think my, my appeal as we go through the just energy transitions is that we have patience with the process because it is a transition and we need to be looking 20, 30 years down the line. And so a lot of what we're supporting, as well as other donors, is making sure that these engagements happen, that they are transparent, that there is a management of expectations. Because of the, sorry, last point, because of the challenges around development, at least in South Africa, is now everyone is looking to the JETP as kind of the savior process. So I think in managing expectations, is this is one of the parts of the development process and it's not gonna solve for everything. So a lot of the you know, poor governance and other challenges you know, will not be solved by JETP. And I think that that's a hard pill to swallow for a country that is kind of the most unequal country on earth. Um, and so uh, moving forward, I think we do need to expect that there will be tension. We also just need to plan accordingly for that and make sure that Obviously, people are supported within this process. Yeah, um, I just got one of our, our one of our fellows here at the center, a woman, Dr. Mance from Ohio State University, is out walking and she watching online. She actually texted me, and I was she asked the question that I was going to ask you just real quickly. You you mentioned something, um, Jacqueline, about some carbon market and nature based solutions work that the Chinese were involved in, and we were wondering is this is this agricultural land? Is it? ag conservation or is this forestry conservation and how transparent is it? Um, well, in case in the case of Zambia, the article came out on Bloomberg two, three days ago. Okay, so, so we don't know yet. Okay, All the information we have, we do not know yet. Um, and I think this issue of transparency in carbon markets um, is one that, you know, we also complained about in, in, in the clean energy um, conversations, right? We, we don't know what's in the contracts. We don't know what governments have agreed to. And so through um, the Africa Carbon Markets Initiative that USAID is um, involved in, we are really pushing for improved transparency, integrity, and equity within carbon markets. And as African countries... Um, you know, decide that this is one of their avenues for increasing climate finance, we're really advocating for, for kind of those three pillars, whether it is with Chinese investors, investors from the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, you know, really doesn't matter, whether it is kind of soil sequestration, forest, doesn't matter, but just really making sure that we do have those three principles so that we once again don't find ourselves with these, this current tensions that still exist in energy, happening in the future yeah, with let's not markets. replicate that yeah. <laughs> okay. um you had one, one we're going to gather two quick questions so short questions for short answers not for all three speakers yeah. just go ahead uh benjamin rob uh from csis um so <clears throat> while china and the u.s are investors in uh south america for critical rare earth minerals and the like um brazil guyana and suriname are continuing to explore and develop new oil fields off their coast so how can uh, the U.S. Uh, specifically, uh, as well as through the Inter-American Development Bank, offer new policies and financial vehicles to make more uh, 
green energy transition uh, policy is attractive when it is in these countries' best interest, financially speaking, to develop these oil fields at the same time. Okay, hold, hold on to that and your question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Parsifal de Sola. I'm from the China Latin America Research Center in Bogota. Uh, my question is for uh, Juliana. So uh, have the close government-to-government -government relations between Argentina and China contributed to the large presence of PRC companies in the lithium sector? Um, so specifically, has the uh, Argentine central or provincial governments implemented policies to attract PRC investment in the lithium sector? Or the alternative, uh, has it been primarily PRC demand driven? Thanks. Okay. They're piling in on you. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Do you want to yeah. see what you can answer? <laughs> <laughs> so, in the first question, thank you very much for. Um, for me, it's difficult because now. Uh, regarding like the the global crisis regarding energy uh, more and more oil and gas is being demanded from south america particularly brazil but also argentina with this field vaca muerta uh, i don't know if you've heard about that but um what could the u.s do in this regard um maybe just uh I think that the, the issue would be financing, uh, like providing like a collaborative, maybe collaborative uh, financing, but the, that, 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 that is the clue. Uh, the clue is about, uh, yeah, financing. And the question, Parsifal, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, close relations have been like, really, there are no policies uh, that governments in Argentina, at least, uh, have like designed regarding uh, or trying to attract Chinese presence. But this has been like a, um, I mean, China really was really interested in, in Argentina becoming part of the BRI. So as Argentina just decided to do it last year, uh, what Chinese companies and also Chinese policymakers in, uh, intended to do is just to penetrate localities before Argentina could make it so they could like get to the sectors before the BRI agreement hmm. uh, could make it. But regarding local uh, partners that they are, they were like really interested. We have like, we have le this um, law regarding attractive, uh, that attracts really the, the mining law uh, in Argentina that was launched during the Washington consensus in the 90s. Uh, has been really attractive to, to I, I mean, in general, like multinational enterprises. But in particular, uh, in particular this uh, law has, uh, and also the constitution, allows uh, local governments to have their own foreign policy. So they have been like mm. really pushy to attract Chinese presence. Mm. So, so Chinese has been like, maybe they, they took like the, the first step, but they have been like, really interested in in companies and banks and uh, other actors chinese actors coming to to the ground okay well good we have to sorry to say this but we gotta stop now but you people in the room can come up and chat with them afterwards but i want to thank you guys for your questions first of all another round of applause for our great speakers <laughs> and you know i Wish we had more time to dive deeper, but you guys can chat with them. But thank you very much. Just um, keep your eye on your emails if you're on our mailing list. End of October, we're going to have a meeting with speakers only from Africa who are NGOs working on Chinese BRI type watchdogging. Thank you so much. You guys did awesome.